Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here dropping in on you. Hope everybody is having a great start to their week. Look, I'm not going to be long. There is a topic that I want to talk about. I've written about it uh, in my book, Born in Captivity, uh, also in Undoing uh, the African American Mind. I have lectured on it, uh, and talked about it in great detail. I want to talk about it with you uh, this um, this afternoon. Uh, I'm not going to go into great depths, but I want to touch on it because I think that it is a part of the frustration and confusion and discussion and emptiness that floats around disguised as uh, theoretic and philosophical debate when it's really a misalignment with true intent, purpose, and um, nature. Uh, and that is, for lack of a better term, the kept woman. We're going to use that term to frame the conversation or the dial, I mean the monologue that uh, I'm going to present to you. And we're going to try and keep it succinct with me. That's not the same as the average person, but uh, nevertheless, I'm going to try to make this as short as I possibly can. Look, one of the things that served to deal a major blow to the black family in the 1960s and the 1970s was the commodification of the black male. In other words, the black man went from being uh, a presence in the home, uh, a father in the home, a husband in the home, um, and uh, a sense of identity for the family and so much more to simply being a paycheck, uh, being measured solely by his capacity to provide. Now, let me say that I'm an old fashioned person in the sense I was reared by my great grandfather. I was reared by a man born in 1909. I was reared by a man who was a provider. Uh, and I was taught that men are to provide. Uh, however, I have to point out the fact that when we lose sight of the totality, and of the nature of the man, we lose sight of the man. When we focus on one area more than we focus on the whole, we miss the point and we devalue people based on one aspect or prospect. And I want to try to give some context to this whole idea. And it all comes, I'm, I'm tired of seeing conversations on social media about if your man can't pay all the bills, uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, the thing is, if your man can pay all the bills, if your man can pay all the bills and that's the way things are set up in the home, then more power to him. But I, I, I want to try to bring some numbers home to show you how foolish the argument is, especially when we're talking about black men. Uh, black men, uh, the disintegration of the black family uh, started on a number of different things. Number one, the black family was struggling. Black men were the head of the households, but black men were either underemployed or either unemployed or underemployed, underpaid, or all three uh, in some way, shape, form, or fashion. In other words, uh, as the cost of living, in living increased, it was becoming increasingly difficult for black men. Then came the deindustrialization of the inner city. Uh, where they start to take away factories, take away manufacturing plants, places where black men could get jobs and make real good money and support their families. It left black men struggling. At the same time, socialization, uh, uh, socialist programs start to move in and, and what the black man could not cover, uh, the government was willing to cover, uh, there was a lot of other things. It's not that simple, and I don't want to make it seem like, oh, here they came, and because the black man didn't have a job, he, the family broke up. No, it was a lot more complex, dynamic than that, and I don't want to get into that because that's not what this is about. But what I can tell you is the black man was commodified. The black man was met with a situation where a number of black w women were uh, or starting to experience upward mobility and access. And what I mean by that is they were be being allowed to move in and matriculate into universities. They were allowed to take those degrees and get good jobs and make good livings on their own. And for the first time, a large number of the uh, black female population uh, was experiencing a certain level of independence. And the traditional 
uh, model for the black family didn't look the same because it was no longer black women sitting under black men, expecting black men to be heads, leaders, and, and controllers of the household. Those who wanted to experience some freedom outside from underneath of men were being able and allowed to do so. In another sense, those who did not possess the drive or the or the wherewithal or, or did not see the opportunities or still were struggling with different mental uh, aspects that uh, perpetuate and promote poverty, they were given uh, other ways to take care of themselves. Section 8 housing, uh, AFDC checks, uh, food stamps, and other programs, uh, Medicaid for children, insurance, and things of that nature. And in many instances, those programs all combined outperformed uh, what the commodified man was capable of doing. Now, that's not the, f the function of the argument. That's to lay the context of what I'm trying to get home here. Um, this idea of the kept woman, first and foremost, we have to sort of kind of frame this. When I say kept woman, to me, a kept woman is a woman that, come, that comes into a situation where the man provides everything. She's kept. She's basically taken care of as if she was a child. She brings very little, if anything, to the table. And, you know, the truth of the matter is, just because a woman doesn't work doesn't mean she's kept. I think we need to, first of all, get that part of the conversation out of the way. Uh, just because a woman doesn't work and bring in a paycheck into the home doesn't mean she's kept. If she is being a mother to the children, if she is keeping the house, if she is providing a valuable level uh, in, the, in, in the way of an environment for peace so that the uh, husband can go out and work and do whatever the husband does to be in a position to support the household without any, uh, uh, without any help from her. Uh, if she's providing that environment, if he walks in his home and his home is a sanctuary, if he walks, and I don't mean in, in, in just in the area of servitude, we have a very small mind as to how things function in the home. It's not just about servitude. My wife does very little in the way of running around, not because she doesn't want to, but because I don't let her. You know, baby, I got your plate, I'll fix your plate. No, sometimes I'll fix your plate. You know, I try to balance that. Uh, I try to I, I try to I try to do that uh, because I see the value in her outside of her running around. Plus, we have kids. We have a lot of kids. Now, fortunately, most of them are grown, but they're always around. It's always something. And so I'm I'm, I'm going somewhere with this. But just because a person doesn't work doesn't mean they're kept to me. Again, that term kept. That term. And that term provider, you got to be very careful about that because here's my problem with the term provider and the idea that a man that cannot take care of the household without help from the wife financially is somehow less than a man. Well, first and foremost, black men are the lowest earners out of men in the United States. We are the lowest earners. We have the lowest median earned income out of all the men in the United States. And so t the idea, the average, uh, the earned, uh, I think the earning medium for the black man is somewhere around forty-two to $45,000 a year. Now, can forty-two to $45,000 a year support a family? It could. It, it, it could if there was some real good management and a lot of sacrifices. But how many women want to live under those uh stringent restrictions and build now that would be the thing that the thing would be to build and see building is done by both it's not done by one person this isn't about somebody finding somebody to latch on to this is about connecting with someone who is going in the same direction and determining how the two of you together can contribute to the building of something greater if it means one person work and the other person go to school and get a degree or get get a training train skill or something that enhances their ability to contribute and then they flip around and let the other person do it, whatever works and whatever is agreed upon or whatever can be honored because honoring the agreement is important. Being able to trust that I'm going to make these sacrifices and that you're going to follow through on your end is extremely important. But what you have to realize is that this idea that 
you know, first of all, you have black women outnumber black men 100 to 83. So for every 100 black women, there are 17 black men missing. Uh, so that's the first challenge. If you're talking about building with a black person and you're selecting black person, that's the first challenge you have to get by. The next challenge is more than half of the men are in no financial situation to be able to provide 100% coverage of the household financially. That's the reality of it. So now are we telling uh, more than 50% of black men in America that they're not men? They're great fathers. They're lovers, they're protectors, they're kind, they're doing a bunch of other things, uh, and they're working to become better providers. And now we're entering into a world where the restrictions that have been over them and governing a lot of what they've been able to do are now being lifted, and you can get out there and create something for yourself in so many different ways now that it's becoming more difficult. But see, that's what this Great Reset is about. The fact that a lot of this wealth is being shifted and a lot of things are changing and now it's out there. But again, uh, the idea that, you know, a man isn't a man because he can't pay the full bills. Now, for me, and here's the thing, the, 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 the median is what, 42, 40,000. And I'm telling you, now the whole thing is, white, the, the, there's a large number of white men not doing it. There's a large number of white men. Uh, I was looking at this. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, close to 60% of married couples have both, couple, both, both parties working. That's white, black, Asian, whatever. Now, obviously, it varies in different uh, racial makeups, but that's the whole. Uh, so the numbers uh, dropped a little in 2020 compared to 2019, but that was because of COVID. And... So you have the median income, what the average person makes. What the average black man makes is less than what the average white man makes. And there are a lot of different variables to go off into that. And there are a lot of things we have to work on to change that. We do need to change it. We do need to create a situation where more black men are in a position to be providers and create a family environment where the wife can take on a traditional role if she desires. But we also need to be aware of uh, where we are now. And the truth of the matter is, depending on what you're doing and how you're moving, what I can tell you is, uh, with you know, I, you know, I never drop numbers and talk a whole lot about whatever because my personal life is my personal life. I show enough of my life for the people who need to see where I'm at can see. But um, I make considerably more than the average black man or the average white man. Now, granted. Uh, we got a pretty large family. I got 13 individuals in this world that call me either dad, daddy, pops, uh, uh, dude, bruh, <laughs> uh, and whatever they mumble under their breath. Now, again, all of them aren't still in the house, but, we, you know, and they range from age 7 to 36. And we had to get them there. And getting them there is not... You know, as easy and inexpensive as you can possibly imagine. So, you, you know, for those of you, three three or four kids, you know, you can imagine what, what, what's going on with all the stuff that happens. Okay, so all that, all that, I said all that to say this. Look, we've got to have a better understanding of the dynamic. No, I'm not talking, I'm not in any way suggesting struggle love. I'm not suggesting get with a brother that don't have his stuff together and that can't produce to you. Let me tell you something, ladies. Let's, let's, ladies, let's just talk for a minute. This is me and the ladies, and I'm going to talk to the guys. Ladies, the first thing you need to ask a man when you meet him is not where he works. It's not what he drives. It's not what he lives in. You need to ask him what his vision is. And if he's able to tell you, he should be a, if he's a man that's on his game, that has purpose, that's headed somewhere, he should be able to tell you not only what his vision is, but how he plans on getting there. Now, he may not be all the way there. I'm still working on my vision, and I've done some unbelievable things. I've, I've done a lot of things that the average man will never do, no matter how long he lives. And I had a vision 
long before I got here. I've been working the vision. I'm still working the vision. It's it, it's an ongoing thing. But what I'm trying to get you to understand is when you meet a man, you want to know what his work is, not what what his job is. See, that's where a lot of you get caught up is you want to know his job. No, what is his work? Because his work takes you long beyond what may be a short career at a job. And it talks about where he's headed, how he thinks, what he looks. How do you fit into his life? Because if he tells you his vision, that's going to be a space in that vision for you. If he tells you a vision, it's going to be a space in that vision for the children and the offspring, the progeny that you create. If he tells you his vision and he can be and he can articulate it in a way that you can tell he's been thinking about it for a long time, that he's really been focused on it, that he's been really been working on it, he might be somebody you want to plug in. Too. You might he might be someone that you want to add your spiritual element to the function and the focus of what he's doing because then you get to put some things into action that may not be in the play. I'm talking about there's a power in the connectivity between the masculine energy and the feminine energy that comes together and creates this synergistic force that many things can't get done outside of. So that's just one thing, but you've got to understand that. Um, you folk a lot of times focus on the wrong thing because what I see is a lot of people who are kept aren't treated well. They 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 front real well, they front real good in front of others, and they give this appearance of the life they live. But see, I'm the one that gets to counsel them. I'm the one that does the interventions. I'm the one that does couples counseling. I'm the one that sits down and knows that oftentimes when there is not an equal exchange, and it doesn't have to be money for money, but if there's not an equal exchange, in other words, if a man is being a provider and he looks at you as a kept woman, he doesn't see the value in you. He's keeping you. He's taking care of you. He doesn't see that there's a fair exchange. See, when, when when you walk into a situation and it's an understanding and he comes in and saying, hey, look, this is just the dude I am. You're not going to work here. You're going to sit down there. Now, what? You know, but he's going to see something in you. He's going to see. And see, brothers, what you got to start understanding is that the value of the woman is got to be seen from the perspective of what she adds to your vision. And if you don't have a sense of vision, if you don't have a sense of purpose, if you don't have an idea of where you're going and where you're headed, she's not going to make sense to you and you're not going to see the value in her outside of if she's bringing something to the table. And if she doesn't work, then you tend to look at her as being less. But she's not less. She's just contributing differently. Now, if she's not contributing equally, then, yeah, there's a problem and there's never going to be an equal uh, exchange of value, an equal exchange of respect, an equal equal exchange of, uh, of care and, 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 and valuation and, and all of the other things that need to be inside that relationship. And so you need to walk into a relationship. And again, just like she's looking for what you're bringing financially, you need to be looked for what she's bringing outside of that if you're capable of covering her. If not, you need to be completely honest with her and tell you how you plan on getting there. Because that should be your goal. Your goal should be able, your goal should be getting to a point where you can. So what your goal has to be is to be intentionally increasing your value by way of capacity to produce income. And so how are you going to do that? And it, it, it's no shame in being anywhere as long as you're not stuck there. It's no shame in being there as long as that's not where you're going to be long term. But what's got to happen and what's got to be understood is that there's so much more to a man than his paycheck. There's so much more to a man that's than what's in his bank account. And when you miss that, you miss how you value a man. And so you don't give the right value to him. So the relationship goes as the money goes. And that's why there's been so much discard and that it's been so easy to create frustration and havoc and conflict between the black man and the black woman because it's too easy to impact the black man's money. But the, again, like I said, that's changing because the black man became commodified and because he became commodified, everything that was looked at was, oh, you know, he's a bum. If he can't pay all the bills, let, let the stories on social media tell it, let all the posts on, so, you know, now on the flip side, like I said, I've seen guys who can, and I've seen in many instances over the course of my life, guys that I've been around that have been, and that was at the point in time in my life with the life that I was living and where I was, there were a bunch of guys. Almost every guy I was around was capable of being sole provider easily. But what I told you, what I can tell you is a bunch of unhappy women. Why? Because it was taught wrong. 
See, it was taught wrong. See, uh, that this whole idea, and it goes back to, and I don't want to get into this because I don't want to bring dude in, but this whole idea about a high-valued man being high-valued because he's a six-figure or seven-figure earner. Now, that doesn't make him a high-valued man. It makes him a six-figure or seven-figure earner. <coughs> but if you keep putting value into the commodity, you lose sight of the things that really, truly matter. Can he be calm? Does he have an answer when there's a problem? Can you be confident in his ability to pull you out of dark moments? Because what I can tell you, there are going to be some moments that no amount of money is going to get you through. Is he calm? Can he move into situations? Is he easily shaken? Does he, does he start to behave emotionally? See, you can't have two emotional people in the home. You, it, it, can he manage his emotions and can he maintain a sense of mental stability in the most trying of times? That's something worth uh, valuing at a, an immensely high thing. Can he figure things out? Because if he can figure things out, when it gets to the point where money isn't available or money won't fix it, he'll still figure it out. Or if it comes to a point in time where there needs to be an increase in revenue he'll figure it out he's not going to be shaken by these things because he has a confidence in himself that he will work things out he will give it figured out and it comes from this drive that he had before he met you that 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 never allowed him to settle never allowed him to just be where he was and be okay and if he's that kind of man it doesn't matter what you face it doesn't matter where you start because you're going somewhere but this whole idea of being kept, see, the thing is, there's no woman in this world beautiful enough for me to keep her. My wife is gorgeous. That's a picture of her sitting right back there. She's gorgeous. She ain't beautiful enough to be kept. Now, she's beautiful enough for, for, for me to sit up and say, you ain't got to work. But that ain't her anyway. Man... This COVID thing came along and created some stuff, drove this woman crazy because, you know, she expects to be able to get out there and the work, the work, field she was in was kind of turbulent. This is a working woman. She worked her whole life. She, you know, before I met her, she had been to some places and did some things. She's not that kind of person that's going to sit around and be okay with being kept. But to me, there's no way I can keep her in the sense of the way I define the word kept. I'm simply contributing to us. I'm contributing to what we have. And there are times that things get real crazy. And I'm saying, hey, you know, this is what's going on right now. And without question, hey, we got it. And we keep moving. But what I'm trying to get you is, look, We've got to get to a place where we truly understand this thing. And if we're sitting up trying to treat black men as if they were white men, and white men aren't even being treated as if they were white men, if you get what I'm saying about this. What I'm saying is there are things that black men simply are not in a position to do. In the grand scheme of things, now there's some, some brothers out there handling their business, and that number is increasing, and I'm so uh, excited about that. But the truth of the matter is, uh, someone making six figures doesn't make them a good man. Somebody making seven figures doesn't make them a good man. And what I find is a lot of my sisters find that out the hard way. Because, see, they've been taught and trained and conditioned to get the bag. And the bag is grab a man that's got money. And what happens is when you come to a man that has money and you're not coming with something of equal value, he doesn't view you the same. I don't care what he tells you. I don't care what happens is at some point in time, the fact that he doesn't value in the, at the level that he feels he needs to be valued because he's bringing so much to the table by way of money, that thing that is so, so coveted, it, coveted that, you know, if he can't, can't have something of equal value, then there's a problem. And so you start to be neglected. You start to be verbally abused, emotionally abused. You start to see it. You talk about all these things where you're seeing these players mistreat their women. See, I saw all of that back in the day in the game when I was out there. I saw it all. They don't respect them. They see them as somebody riding their coattails. They either haven't taken the time to observe and understand the value of that woman or in their eyesight they can't see it or find it she's just cute and she came along she was good at the time she's getting on my nerves now she needs to sit down somewhere be quiet shut up 
that's because he chose wrong or he didn't choose through the right lens. He, he looked at what he brought to the table and thought that qualified him for some special uh, categorization that says, I don't have to be honorable, I don't have to be respectful, I don't have to be loving. And that's because you gave him that power when you coveted, when you coveted his money, when you coveted his financial covering and didn't see everything else and you didn't bring enough to the table to bring the balance in the scales of the relationship. So you don't have to have money. I told my wife, you know, from point blank, hey, it's up to me to figure it out. Now, whatever you feel you want to add and you can do it, but don't be over there stressing about it. That's on me. That's on me to figure out. Don't, 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 don't do that. But what, but what my wife brings to the table is the house is going to be okay. The kids are going to be okay. She's going to have a little stuff. Then she's going to come and she's going to pour into me. She's going to pour into me in ways that me, we men don't like to admit, but we know we need. See, there's a deepness that goes in beyond that. She can see the vision. She can connect with the vision. She's driven as much as I am for the vision. She bought into the vision. And it's about both of us. And, and, and nothing has shown me more in the last couple of months how much she's committed to the vision. It's not just me. It's we. And that is, you know, some time in, it's me. And that's, that's what I'm talking about. It's so much more than that money. Again, don't get me wrong. Money is necessary. I can tell you that. Money is definitely necessary, and I think that we have to increase our capacity for it. That's why I'm always telling people you need to own yours. You need to create your own capacity. You need to be out there finding ways to increase your earning capacity, increase your financial uh, aptitude to understand not only how to get it, but how to use it, how to handle it, how to uh, make it work for you. Those are all things that you have to have a clear understanding in. So this whole idea of the kept woman is an illusion. If you're not bringing anything to the table, and you're being kept, you're not being honored. You're not being valued property. If you're bringing a lot to the table just because you're working don't mean you're kept. Kept means there's an imbalance in power, imbalance in presence, and imbalance in equality. When you come into a relationship, if it's not equal, then there's a problem. Kept women aren't equal because the value is focused on the money. But a woman that comes in and provides a space for a man to where he feels like a man when he walks in the house, where he knows no matter what kind of war he waged throughout the day to be who he is, he can come in at home, he can put his sword down and not have to worry about picking it up until he leaves in the morning because ain't no wars gonna be waged in the house. That is invaluable to walk in and the way she looks at you isn't that goes my 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 sugar daddy that goes my my honey bunch that she's looking at you that's the man that holds me and i don't mean physically i mean spiritually holds and covers me she immediately through her look in your eyes tells you she's feeling safer now that you're home that sits up and edifies the manhood inside of you that's invaluable She feels your conversation when you come in so that you can decompress. She offers what wisdom she has in her suggestions, not in telling you what to do, but in acknowledging she's aware that you are contemplating something and she contributes. Maybe she's a great cook, maybe not. But I guarantee she's got to be bringing something to the house so that there's a level of equality in the home and balanced. Stop having these conversations about who's paying the bills and start creating a situation to where it's so much abundance that it doesn't matter. You know, there's a bunch of people probably won't like that. But again, y'all know me, right? Y'all know I don't care. 
You know, I am not here to be liked. I'm not here to earn your approbation. I'm not here to be popular. I'm not here to get shares because if I was, I would have more than 7,000 subscribers right now. That's not why I'm here. I'm here hoping that I can teach. I'm hoping that I can share. I'm hoping that I can enlighten. I'm hoping that I can awaken. I'm hoping that I can challenge you to be better because what we're going to have to be, if we're ever going to experience true liberation, is to raise our level of existence by raising our thought patterns and how we think critically and how we engage one another. And again, we are going to have to reestablish the black family nucleus in some way. We're going to have to do it because that's the origin of the value system where young people develop the values, interests, and principles that compel them and propel them in life. And we are not in a situation right now where we're doing very well at that. We're doing more fighting and, and money counting and pocket watching and all of that stuff like that instead of bringing the intangibles to the table as well. Again, I'm not saying a man isn't supposed to be capable. What I'm saying is you got to understand your reality and know what the truth is. Like I said, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, there's no group where all the men are working and, and caring for the women. And or if they're not, they're being degraded as not being men. Now, I'm very hard on the men when they're not handling the women right. And cats, you cats that are out there that's got your paper straight. You know, so let's just say cats from six figures and up. Stop trying to make other cats who don't have feel less than. How about we gird one another up? I'm going to tell you something. When I was on my way up, one of the most frustrating things I found was that I could not turn to my own people. And I talked to my wife about this in her business. It's the same way. Um, when I talk, uh, uh, when, when I was trying to find a black person to school me in business in my early 20s because I knew I was going to get into business after I left what I was doing, I was going to get into business. And, 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 um, I would get get cars. That's when everybody had a business card. I passed my car. Hey, give me a call. I call them. Don't return my call. Give me some roundabout ways. Never ever truly feel my questions. And all the things I learned about business, I learned from non-blacks. My mentor that you hear me talk about all the time is actually a Jew. And if you know me, you know, that was not an easy relationship to build. We build a relationship now of mutual respect. And that's what I'll call it, a mutual respect, because it was always understood. I'm going to teach you something, but I'm going to get something out of it. That's something he told me. He said, it's not about who you like in business. It's about who you can win with in business as long as you can trust them. I work with people I don't like all the time. I don't have to like them. I just have to trust them. He says one of the problems that blacks have is they move on their emotions. They will throw money away because they don't like you. But so I understood that our relationship was never about the fact he liked me. It was about the fact that he liked my mind. He liked how my mind thought, how my mind moved, how I operated and how I conceived things. And he knew that he could make money with me and I was going to learn from him and I was going to benefit from that relationship. And that's what happened. But I had to learn from somebody that wasn't a part because that's how we are. We get it and then we get over here with it and we're afraid if we go give it to somebody that looks like us, they might outperform us and that's the one thing we have over them is that we are doing better than them. Stop competing with your brothers. Pull your brothers up. Show them how to do it. It's enough for all of us to eat. We're going to have to get out there and make it happen but hey, we got to stop that. Look, on that note, look, I'm going to get out of here. I got a bunch to do. As a matter of fact, I got to get home and check on the family at the house um, and do some things there as well. But I, I just had to drop that on you. Take it as it is with a grain of salt. Those that get it, get it. Those that get hot, hey, love you anyway. But I'm going to call a spade a spade. We got to do better than what we're doing. On that note, I'm out of here. Take care. Don't forget. Show some love and, 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 and contribute to the work we're doing in uh, the Odyssey Project within the inner city. Uh, share some of the burden. <clears throat> On that note, I'm Hello, everybody. Dr. Rick Wallace here dropping in. I will not be before you long, 
but what I do need to reinforce and reiterate with uh, great uh, specificity is the fact that if we ever needed your support here at the Odyssey Project, we need it now. Uh, there are so many different battles going on on so many different fronts, but one of the things that I'm immensely pa passionate about and can uh, never successfully overlook or sidestep around is the failure uh, of protecting and covering our children, preparing our children, educating our children, giving our children a fighting chance in this world. There are constant headlines of our children dying. Uh, at the hands of those who are supposed to protect them, at the hands of law enforcement, or becoming incarcerated uh, because of a failure to be prepared, and so many other things that we are going to have to be responsible for. We can no longer be uh, satisfied with sitting idly by and going, oh my God, shaking my head, that's sad, that's a shame. We're going to have to become actively involved in being a part of the change, being a part of empowering our youth. So at this moment, I am calling out and I'm asking you uh, to support the work we do at the Odyssey Project. You will always be able to find a way to do so by looking in the description box at the top of the description box of any video on the Black Voice channel and any other platform where you see videos concerning black issues. You will see how you can support us by either clicking a link or giving directly through the organization's Cash App account. Again, this is a time in which we really need to step forward. So again, I'm asking, step forth and show some love and show some support.